what everybody else chose to write about, and I don't even remember what the topics were. Uh, Job's Path to Enlightenment, Wisdom Through Psalms, Job's Wisdom, Wisdom in the Book of Proverbs, Wisdom According to Proverbs, Conclusion of Wisdom Resides in Ecclesiastes, Wisdom in Proverbs, Job's Wisdom, Defining Wisdom According to Proverbs, The Endless Wisdom of Job, What is Wisdom in the Book of Proverbs, Impact of Proverbs, Life Lessons of the Biblically Wise, How to Build the House of Wisdom, uh, Wisdom from Speaking with God, Job's Wisdom Gained Through Adversity, <coughs> Definition of wisdom according to the Bible, the gift of wisdom, gaining wisdom through the suffering of Job, the wisdom Job gained, the wisdom bestowed unto Job. So I should be thoroughly wise when I finish reading these. <laughs> <coughs> I won't blame you if I'm not. <clears throat> okay, we are starting the Gospels today. Um, I don't know how much we'll get to. Mark, I'm hoping we'll get through, take that back, we'll get through all of Matthew, even if we have to skip most of it. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the introduction to the New Testament. I hope you read that, because that gives some, some take that back, I will say a couple things. That, that does give some important background in terms of when the various books were composed, or the time frame in which they were composed, and how the 27 books that are in the Bible as the New Testament got to be the 27 books that are in the Bible as the New Testament. Because there were a whole lot of other books written during this period that are not in the New Testament. There's a Gospel of Thomas. There's a Gospel of James. They're not included in the New Testament. And both Thomas and James are apostles. One of the, your introduction mentions, one of the main qualifiers... Um, For inclusion was it had to have apostolic authority so why weren't those two included well your introduction doesn't really talk about I don't want to get into a sticky thick sticky thicket it doesn't really address fully how the books were determined to be quote-unquote canonical all it says in talking about the word canon, page 1169, is what that word comes from, and that that word comes to denote or signify the rule, a norm, what's acceptable, okay? But it doesn't really address how the canon, what was determined to be the rule, was determined. It kind of punts on that idea. Um, Bottom of page 1170. Because from the top of uh, from the bottom of 1169 through most, <clears throat> excuse me, of 1170, it's talking about various ways, various people suggested things ought to be included. For for example, I don't even think it mentions it in here. Um, Martin Luther in the 16th century didn't think, for example, that the Book of James should be included in the New Testament. And that's, you know, 1,500 years, essentially, 1,400 years, after it was written. Luther said, shouldn't be included in the New Testament. And there's a reason why. The book of James is largely about, anybody know? Works. <laughs> James writes, faith without works is dead. There is no faith if you don't do good works. Good works just meaning... We will see what Christ talks about in his parable of the last judgment, chapter 25 of Matthew. Okay? So, because of that, Martin Luther said it should be in there. Why? Because Luther preached salvation is by grace alone. Period. There's nothing you could do. Didn't add to your salvation, etc. So, strike the book of James, etc. So, your, your introduction... <coughs> gets down to the bottom, the very last paragraph, and says, the tests of canonicity, which were most frequently applied, seem to have been, as I mentioned before, apostolic authorship. 
The Gospels are what? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Even though the Gospel of Matthew doesn't say in the text of it, the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Okay, that title that comes at the top, that's not in most of the manuscripts. Right? Anyways, or at least apostolic content. In general harmony, that is, it's got to basically agree. Okay? Some of those things that aren't included, for example, the Gospel of Thomas, has a lot of weird stuff in it. Has a lot of weird, what's called hidden knowledge. What are, what's more specifically called Gnostic teaching. Okay? The Gnost, we see that, we see the G-N-O in words like ignorance. G no means knowledge. Okay? So the Gospel of Thomas, one of the things it talks a lot about are the hidden teachings of Jesus. The teachings that aren't recorded anywhere else in the New Testament. Well, that's one of the reasons it's not called a canonical gospel. It doesn't agree with everything else that's here. Okay? So, what else? However, prior, however, to the issuing of pronouncements by church councils, <laughs> was the intuitive insight of individual Christians who had discerned the inherent significance of the canonical books. Well, what the hell does that mean? I'm going to assume for the moment, for the sake of this argument, everybody <coughs> here is a Christian. And that kind of means, for the purpose of this statement, person A says, well... I think this book ought to be included because reason A through C. And person back there says, I think that book shouldn't be. Well, what happens when two people disagree? Uh, what becomes the arbiter? What becomes the reference? Look at the rest of the, the next sentence. So, Prior, however, to the issue of pronouncements by church councils was the intuitive insight of individual Christians who had discerned the inherent significance of the canonical books. But you got to take the canonical part out because it's before they were canonical books. So that was individual Christians said, I don't know, something inside me says this is in and this isn't in. In the most basic sense, neither individuals nor councils created the canon. So, a single individual didn't say, these are the 27 books, and a single council, because your, your introduction to the Old Testament, your introduction to the Bible, at the beginning of the, um, this book, and the introduction to the New Testament, talks about councils, talks about groups of bishops coming together and saying, these books are included, these books are not, etc., but this says, in the most basic sense, neither individuals nor councils created the canon. They only came to recognize and acknowledge the self-authenticating quality of these writings. I'll ask the same question. What the hell does that mean? And the reason I'm asking the question is because I'm wanting you to think about the possibility that your editors are dodging. The editor doesn't want to take a quote-unquote theological stance. Why? And the editor for the New Testament is Bruce Metzger. Probably, I don't think he's still alive, he might be. Probably one of, if not the foremost, New Testament biblical scholar Alive when he was alive. He wrote a whole bunch of books about the manuscripts of the New Testament, the parchments, the whole night. I mean, he knew this stuff like you know the back of your hand. All right? So why not take a stance? Well, because you have the Catholics, you have the Orthodox, you have the Protestants, and within Protestants, what do you have? About 22,000. 22,000 different denominations. 
within the product, the general product, you know, big, big Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ, Episcopalian, ain't all the way down to, you know, some little sect with 15 believers, which actually that wouldn't be included in the 22,000 because they would never be counted somewhere. So roughly 22, and they all do what? They all look at the scriptures a little bit differently. Some say the Orthodox and the Catholic, for example, say go back to the Old Testament for a moment. It includes what they call the larger canon. What is included in the back of your book as the Apocrypha. First, second, third, Maccabees, Esdras, Tobit, <clears throat> Judith, those are all included in what's called the Orthodox Study Bible. They are included in Catholic Bibles. They're not included in Protestant Bibles. King James Version doesn't have them. In fact, most King James Versions won't even have them in the back as supplements, appendices, etc. So, this is supposed to be what? Look at the little sub heading down here. An ecumenical study Bible. What's ecumenical mean? Kind of incorporating everybody. Can't we all just get along? Mentality. All right? So, they don't want to take a stance saying, here is how the New Testament came to be. Even though it's pointed out, uh, third paragraph before the end, on page 1170, the last sentence of that third paragraph. <coughs> St. Athanasius, this is Athanasius the Great, who was bishop slash patriarch of Alexandria. Okay? He was present at what's called the First Ecumenical Council in 326. Council called together by the emperor to answer the question of who the hell is Jesus? Literally, who is he? Is he just a man or is he God? And part of the question was, or is he God and not man at all? Or is he all man and nothing related to God? Or is he a mixture of the two? Okay? And they hammered out a definition essentially. Well, St. Athanasius is the very first person who says, these 27 books, that's it. That's it. And everybody after that, with a few exceptions, like Martin Luther, but even Martin Luther, when he translated the New Testament, he included the book of James. Why? Because he kind of, you know, approached it with a little bit of humility. Who, who am I to say... 1,500 years of church history is wrong, you know. So, all that aside, Matthew. Why does Matthew kick off the New Testament? Why is Matthew put it first? Because your introduction doesn't mention. It doesn't say anything about that. In fact, your introduction says, which of the Gospels was probably written first? Probably, because there's not unanimity in, in scholarly consensus. Mark. It says Mark probably was written first. And Matthew and Luke are probably, according to biblical scholarship, probably, again, not every, not all biblical scholars agree with this, probably are based on Luke. Excuse me, are based on Mark. Matthew and Luke are probably based on Mark. Obviously, they're not just copies of Mark, right? Because Matthew is 20. 7, 28 chapters long, and Mark's only 16. How do you get more material based on less material? Okay. So, Matthew comes first. Well, how does Matthew begin? Genealogy of Jesus. The genealogy of Christ. Where does that begin? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It goes back to Abraham. Where are we? In terms of the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 12. So what is that genealogy doing? Obviously, it's linking Christ with who? Anybody. Abraham, right? Okay. And then doing what? Tracing that lineage all the way forward. Well, tracing that lineage all the way forward 
means what in terms of the Old Testament? Through every book after Genesis 12. I don't mean every one of Christ's ancestors is mentioned. It's not like Nahum says, oh, here's a name, because prophecy, Jesus is coming in the future. Not that case. It's just that throughout every book that we have in the Old Testament, according to this genealogy, the ancestors are moving on along. They keep having children. And who's Christ, you know, related to? Are these all quote-unquote and I'm going to use this in a... Are these all quote-unquote upright, good people? Solomon. Solomon lost his wisdom. Okay? Who else? Tamar. Yeah, why'd you go king? Who is Tamar? Tamar was Judah. Judah's Reuben's. Uh, yeah, Judah. Tamar was um, Judah's daughter-in-law. I think it's Judah. Did Judah the father present Zira by Tamar? I want to keep one of something in my mind is telling me it's Reuben. Um and he sleeps with his daughter-in-law. Why? Because he thought she was a hooker. It's, it's almost like it's you know, kind of glossed over. Okay? But we get all the way up to David. Okay. Uh, still chapter 1. Matan, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Joseph. Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. But according to the story we're going to be told, what is Joseph really to Christ? Stepfather. Stand-in father, right? Because his real father is God and such. So we get chapter 1, uh, verse 18 and following. And before we, we go uh, through the rest of that, let's talk a little bit about this structure. So this is the overall structure, and I, I ripped this off like I am a lot of stuff, from the Oxford Companion. So, but I've, I've added some stuff in here, so it's not totally theirs. So you get what's called the presentation of Jesus, right? Because it starts with chapter 1, verse 1. Here's the genealogy of Jesus. Okay? Now, did everybody listening to Jesus at the time know that? That is, when John the Baptist says, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's according to the Gospel of John. Do the people who hear him go, oh, so his father must be, and his father must be, and his father, and they go all the way back? No. Who, what do they know? Jesus, son of Mary and Joseph. In fact, we're going to see at one point, he's going to do something, they're going to go, isn't that Jesus? Mary's son? Joseph the carpenter? How does he know this stuff? How's he able? Okay. But they don't go any farther back than that. So who's this written for? What's the purpose of it? Well, one, it's probably written for Jews. Why? Are Gentiles going to care? Are Greeks going to care? I'm just using Greek as an example of a Gentile. Are Greeks going to care who the... Jesus is related to. Nope. Doesn't mean anything to them. But for Jews, that genealogy is very important. Why? Because there's all that messianic prophecy in the Old Testament that says the Messiah must be, for example, a son of David. So if he's not a son of David, by the way, Mary also, her lineage, is traced through David. Okay? So, Structure. Presentation of Jesus, 1 1 through 4 16. 4 16 is. Four, four. Why is it 4 16? I have no idea. It's um, probably should be 3 16. 
or three. Yeah, that should be 316. It's got to be a typo in that book. That's when Jesus goes to be baptized. Right? That is definitely wrong. That's 316. Right? When Jesus appears to be baptized, prior to that moment, he's a secret. He's a cipher. Nobody knows, nobody knows who he is. Okay? So this, you know, from birth to roughly age 30. Okay? Then his ministry to Israel, probably really 3, 6, 317 to 11 1. Okay? And I'm, I'm presenting this to you because this is what's in the Oxford Companion. I don't understand this entirely in terms of how outline. Because outline, when you have a number and then embedded into that, you've got three things. Those three things pretty much inform what's up here. But notice this is 417 to 11.1. And yet down here, it goes through 16. That doesn't make sense to me. But his ministry to Israel, that is to the Jews. So, Sermon on the Mount, pretty long. We'll talk about, we won't go through the whole thing. His missionary talk, that is when he gets ready to send his disciples out, he tells them, do this, 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 and this. Okay? Not too long. And, part of B also, Israel's denial of Christ. Is it really Israel? The nation? Does the nation deny Christ? No, there's a lot of people who welcome him, right? I mean, what we call today Palm Sunday, that's all the people coming out, throwing the palm leaves on the ground, crying, crying out, Hosanna, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not Israel. Who's really meant by Israel? The other ones that begins with a P. Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, Sanhedrin, the leaders. The, high, the elites. Okay. <laughs> Things haven't changed, man. It's the elites against the little guys. Okay? So I don't know that I call Jesus, you know, being the big guy and the little guy, so to speak. Okay? So, and you get that in 11 2, and that's partly, this doesn't encapsulate all of that denial. Because down here, you still get him coming up to him and asking him questions, trying to trip him up. And, you know, if you're going to include the denial of Jesus, what else has to be included there? Uh, his crucifixion has got to be included there. Okay? So parables, parables aren't limited to only chapter 13. He tells parables in chapters 21 and 22 also. In fact, he tells parables in chapter 25. When he talks about the last judgment. Okay. Third major section, preparation for and his passion. Okay. This includes they're up in Galilee, and he says, You know the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up. Well, that's him telling the disciples, get ready. Bad stuff's gonna happen. Okay. So they head up to Jerusalem. Why is it called up to Jerusalem? See, most people, I don't know why, but we do the thing we say down south. Well, south, you know, in terms of a map, you have the North Pole, <clears throat> South Pole, so you're going down. A lot of people say or think the same kind of thing. You're going down to Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem is south of Galilee. But Christ... And the Gospels don't use that language. They say going up to Jerusalem. Because it's on the mountain. Okay? So they go up to Jerusalem and such. And then while there, before the crucifixion and stuff, what's he do? He talks about the church, meaning his disciples. And what's the purpose of those talks? We'll look at them a bit. Get ready. Prepare. We'll see, hopefully, part of what he's doing there is he is recapitulating. He is summing up again an awful lot 
of what the Old Testament says. Because, you know, what did we see in not Jonah, but in Habakkuk, in Zechariah, in Malachi? Who will overcome? Who will make it to the quote-unquote Lord's Day? Those with faith. If you have faith, then you will overcome. Well, I think in do I want to say every man? I'm not going to say every. I'm going to say because of my own frailty. I think in almost every miracle that Christ does, not miracle like changing water into wine, but miracle when somebody comes to him and is sick or has a demon or has a withered arm or is blind or deaf or something, what does he say to that person makes that person whole? Their faith. It's kind of like, it wasn't me that did it. You did it. It's your belief in me is what enabled that to happen, etc. Okay? And then within this, this structure, you've got, within Matthew, kind of like three key stories that are being told. You've got the story of Jesus, Right? It's called a, and your instruction does talk about this. It's called a gospel. Sorry, one out. Well, that comes from Old English, God spell, which your book tells you means good tidings. Spell doesn't mean tidings. We don't even use that word anymore. So why not update it? It means good word, good story. The good story of Jesus of Nazareth, or the good word of Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? Then you have the story of his opponents. So if you need basic, you know, literary kind of structure, every good story has two things. Think Harry Potter. You got Harry Potter and Lord Voldemort, protagonist, antagonist, okay? Um, John Milton's Paradise Lost, which is about the fall of Adam and Eve, you have essentially God, <clears throat> Satan, you know, in, in most human mythology. Good, <laughs> evil. It's, it's the basic, it's the primary conflict behind all conflicts. So, if you're going to present a strong protagonist, and we've not talked about that word. <laughs> Which means, really, it comes from protos agonistes. Protos, first, chief, main, or primary. Take a guess as to agonistes. What does it mean when you're in agony? You break a leg. You dislocate a shoulder. You're in pain. Is it is like, you know, sticking yourself with a thorn pain? No. It's severe. It's excruciating pain. I shouldn't have used the word excruciating because what's the root of that? Cross. Okay. The first sufferer. The chief sufferer, the main sufferer, the primary sufferer. So a protagonist in a story is the person really who suffers the most. Okay? So you have a protagonist and an antagonist. The antagonist is the one who causes the suffering, essentially. Right? Look at all the Gospels. If it weren't for the Jewish leaders, what kind of life would Jesus have? Go off in fantasy land, you know. What would like it be like if, kind of a story. What would Jesus' life be like if he didn't have the Jewish scribes and Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the know-it-alls? Yeah, he wouldn't have died. Because you wouldn't have had anybody to tell Pilate, arrest this guy. People would be going, hey, he's a nice guy. He's a carpenter. Yeah, okay, he's got some wild ideas out there, you know. Turn your cheek when somebody punches you. Yeah, really. 
Right? Story-wise, every story has to have an antagonist. The third main story is about these people. Right? The disciples. And guess what? You're going to see essentially this same structure in the other Gospels. I would say, I'm going out on a limb here, with the exception of perhaps John's Gospel. Why? Because John's Gospel is radically different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic. Why? Sin means with or together an optic see or look. They look alike. They seem alike. They seem similar. John's Gospel isn't. John's Gospel is pure, pretty much all pure theology. These are, these are what? This is biography. Jesus did this, and then a few days later, he went and did this, and he got in a boat, and he went across, and then he did this, and then he did this, and then he did this. And in the meantime, you get a lot of, and he said this. Okay? So, that's the basic structure. Now go back. So we get the birth of Christ. All right? And we're not going to go over it, because you've heard, you know, watch Charlie Brown Christmas, and you'll hear, you'll hear this. Okay? So, we find out how he's born... And he's born during the reign of Herod. Your footnote tells you when Herod died, 4 BC. Well, how can that be? How can he die four years before the birth of Christ when Jesus was born when Herod was king? Because the English monk who came up with the terminology before Christ and Anno Domini in the year of our Lord, a guy named Bede in the 7th, in eight centuries, um, he was off in his chronology. Okay? It's now thought that Jesus was probably born sometime around 6 BC. Six years before his birth, in other words. Okay? Um, why? Because Herod has the little children, the male, young male children, killed when? Anybody know? Two years after the wise men come. It's two years. All right? So the wise men come. They say, we saw a star in the east. The wise men get there. It's, it's often thought by the quote-unquote tradition of the church that Jesus is not a little baby, that they don't arrive, you know, on the morning that he's born that they get there about two years later. And so when they bring the gifts and everything, Jesus is probably a toddler, an infant. All right? And they give their gifts. They've already spoken to Herod. Right? The angel comes. Joseph and them leave. They go off to Egypt, and they don't come back for another couple of years. Why? Because it's about two years later that Herod dies in 4 BC. So... Joseph goes off, takes his child and mother to Egypt. And then he hears another vision, has another vision. Angel tells him, take him back. So, pick up with chapter 3. We get John the Baptist. Okay. Now, in this gospel, are we told anything about Jesus' relation to John the Baptist? Do we get anything about John's birth? Nope. Jesus is John's cousin. John's three months older. Okay. We just hear, in those days, it's not specified, it's not like the prophecies, you know, in the second month of the second year of the reign of king. So John comes and he, he's preaching. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does the is at hand mean? Now. Now. 
See, all the Old Testament was doing what? Pointing. All the, you know, the prophets, the four prophets that we talked about, and then the other day when I came, kind of the, the big over, overview. What do all of the prophets talk about? Every one of them. The coming day of the Lord. Well, that's the kingdom of heaven. He's saying the kingdom of heaven is now. How? Do we see the lion lie down with the lamb? No. <laughs> Do we see the little child put his hand in the adder's, the snake's hole? Uh, no, we don't. Why? Because that day of the Lord is a much more specific thing than the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, John's preaching this. The people understand what that means. They understand that that means the Messiah is coming. But what are they thinking of when they think of Messiah? They think of those enthronement psalms. For example, in the book of Psalms, which are all about what kind of king being enthroned? A military leader. A mighty warrior. This is the person who's going to come and do what? Well, we haven't talked about it, and your introduction doesn't talk about it. A little bit of biblical history. We did a little bit with the Babylonian captivity and stuff. But beginning in around 200, 300 AD, uh, BC, the Jews aren't free people. Really, you could go back to the Babylonian captivity, and when they come back to Israel, they're not free in the sense that they determine their own destinies. They've got peoples from the north and peoples from the south ruling over them, primarily people from the north, Greeks, for two to three hundred years before this book opens. Now, when this book opens, who's in control? Who, Romans. Herod represents Rome. Herod's a Jew. Right? He is a Jew. But he represents Rome. He is the Jewish king that Rome has installed. Okay? So, they're expecting some kind of military leader who will throw off the Roman yoke. And who will do what? Reinstitute what kingdom? Not Jeroboam's, not Uzziah, not Hezekiah, David's. David's kingdom. When David died, handed on the throne to Solomon. According to the you know the account that we get in the the Chronicles and Kings, the kingdom of United Judah and Israel was at its largest. It went from the Mediterranean. My memory might be slipping here, so forgive me if I'm wrong. Went from the Mediterranean over into what is modern-day Iraq. Whichever one is the westernmost of the Tigris and Euphrates. They're pretty close. It doesn't really matter much. And it went down to what is modern-day, didn't include, but went down to the Red Sea. You know, that whole area north of the Red Sea up to modern-day Israel, the Sinai Peninsula. That used to be Israeli in the late 20th century. They gave it back to Egypt as part of the, what was it? Camp, not Camp David Accords, the um, Dayton Accords that Clinton had Yasser Arafat and whoever the Israeli prime minister was sign. Okay? But, it, you know, so modern-day Lebanon parts of Syria over to part of Iraq, all the way down to the Red Sea. A lot, lot more than modern day little sliver of land Israel. You know, 30 yard, 30 miles wide today from the eastern border of Israel to the Mediterranean and about, if I remember correctly, 70 or 80 miles long. Pretty small land. So they're expecting... We're going to have our empire back, right? We get a description of John, what John wears. Why? Why is that description necessary? He's a prophet. He's a simple guy. And he's a simple guy. Notice he's not one of the elite. 
He's not one of the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees. He's not somebody who started, studied biblical theology at Harvard Divinity School or something like that. Okay? But he's a prophet. He dresses like the Old Testament prophets. Okay? And we're told all Jerusalem and Judea went out to listen to him. And Jesus is going to ask later, why did you go out to listen to him? Because he's kind of weird? Because he said some cool things? Yeah, I mean, that's why he asked that partially. So, John blessed the Pharisees and such. And he goes on and says, verse 11, we're going we're, we're gonna to skip a lot. I baptize with water for repentance, but he is coming after me who is mightier than I. Now, your introduction doesn't mention this. John doesn't institute baptism. Baptism is a Jewish practice. But in the Old Testament, it wasn't, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The baptism was a cleansing rite. John is not baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's after Jesus is baptized, gains his disciples, and he tells them in the missionary discourse, and he sends them out, and then he says what? Baptize. All right? And then, you know, we won't talk about it much because we don't have time, but an awful lot of the letters are all about how you do baptism and such, or they include commentary on that. So, Jesus comes to him. Notice when Jesus comes to him, he doesn't have any followers. He's just, you know, Joe Blow out there, dressed like everybody else. But he comes to John, and we're told John would have prevented him. That is, whoa, I know who you are. How does John know that? Louder? His cousin. His cousin, okay. There's no indication, even though that's true, there's no indication anywhere in the Gospels that Jesus and John spend time together as cousins. In fact, if there's any implication, it's that John, from a young age, he's out there living in the desert. Okay? Like several of the Old Testament prophets did, away from the people. He comes to Jesus, and it's like a light goes on. And Jesus says, I need you to baptize me. And John, um, I need to be baptized by you. No, 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 no. You've got to do this to me. Jesus, just chill. Let it be so now. That is, do what I'm asking, for thus it is fit, fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness, what does that really mean? we got to do this by the letter of the law. So, you have to do this to me. So, John consents, all right? Keep in mind, John probably knows who Jesus is, so he's like, okay, Lord. So John baptizes him. And when Jesus was baptized, he went immediately from the water. That is, this isn't a good Presbyterian, you know, sprinkle. He puts them all the way down in the water. And Jesus is baptized just once because he's not baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's baptized for cleansing. He comes up out. And we get this passage. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And you've got a footnote. <clears throat> Verses 16 and 17, which are when Jesus comes up out of the water and the Spirit descends like a dove, a description of the surge of certainty and self-understanding that came to Jesus at his baptism. Now, what kind of footnote is that? That is pure, pure interpretation. Is it based on anything that is actually said in the text? No, it is not. And it's all based on the idea that the he and the him that are referred to 
or Jesus. That Jesus comes out of the water, looks up, and he sees a dove come down on him. Is that who sees the dove, though? Because there's an awful lot. I mean, that is generally a Protestant interpretation. I'm not saying all Protestants think this, but it's generally a Protestant interpretation. The Catholic and Orthodox almost unanimously say that the he and him, that's John. John sees the Spirit descend in the form of a dove. It has nothing to do with self-awareness and self-understanding. Okay? And then there's a voice. Is Jesus the only one that hears the voice? We do know that there are times within the Bible, within the stories, that a voice is heard from heaven. Some people hear it, and other people hear what? Thunder. Saul's Damascus Road experience. Saul hears a voice. The others see lightning and hear thunder. And they're like, look at that. No clouds in the sky, lightning and thunder. Okay? And then what happens? Jesus goes off to the wilderness. Notice he's led up by the Spirit. But we're going to hear a passage later on when he casts the, the, the demons from the, the demoniac, the gathering demoniac, he casts them into swine. Okay? And the people come to get him, and we're told the Spirit led him away. The way that's usually interpreted is he disappears. It's not like the Spirit says, move away there, move away, leave him, give him room. It's he disappears from their midst. Okay? So he goes off to the desert. Why? Temptation. He's, he's got to pass this ritual, this rite. How so? Go back to Adam and Eve. Because you can say in a sense, Okay, notice that key in a sense. I don't mean this literally. You could say in a sense that Jesus' baptism is, in a sense, his creation as, at that point, the new Adam. Well, what has to happen to the new Adam to be the new Adam? He's got to do what the old Adam didn't do. And what did the old Adam not do? Resist temptation. Resist temptation. Okay? Go back real briefly. I know we don't have time for it. Genesis 3. Satan says to Adam and Eve, to Eve, she relates it to Adam. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing every knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and desired to make one wise. So, food, delightful, wisdom. Look at Jesus' temptation. If you're the son of God, Turn these low, turn these stones into bread. Well, there's the first part of Eve's temptation, food. And Jesus, you know, does what? Quotes scripture back to him. Because what's Satan doing there? Ooh, proof text. I'm going to pull up in the Bible. Okay? So Jesus says no. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will give his angels charge over you. And Jesus says, yeah, but it's also written, so I see your Bible verse and I raise you one. Devil takes him to a very high mountain, shows him the glory of all the kingdoms of the world. Now, some people would say, that equates with wisdom. Because who would be damn fool enough not to take wisdom? all the kingdoms of the world. But what kind of wisdom would that be? Earthly, worldly wisdom. And Christ says, and it also says, you shall only serve, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only, and then the devil leaves him. And then we're suddenly told, verse 12, 
he heard he hears that John is arrested and he goes back to Galilee. Okay? And from that time, verse 17, Jesus begins to preach, saying what? Exactly what John said. Okay? So he calls Andrew and Peter. And how does he call them? This is important for this class because this class is the Bible and slash as literature. What kind of language does he say? You, Mr. Andrew, and you, Mr. Peter, follow me and I will make you suffer. You will be my disciples and you will learn stuff that you've never learned before. And I will build a community of believers about you and thousands and hundreds of years from now, people will call you, Peter, you know, the rock upon whom I built this church, blah, 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 blah. Nope, what's he do? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What is the phrase fishers of men? It's figurative speech. He uses an image. I mean, it implies a story. So they're used to throwing out nets, catching fish. Now they're going to throw out nets and catch men. What kind of nets? Verbal, rhetorical. What, what kind of education do Peter and Andrew have? Probably none. They can read. They can write. But probably not much more than that. I mean, they probably know somewhat the scriptures. Why? Because they attend synagogue. And the scriptures are read weekly in synagogue. But, assuming we ever get to it, probably won't. We're going to, you know, we'll read the, the um, book of Acts. And Peter stands up and he delivers a whale of a sermon. And people are going, the guy's a fisherman. How do you learn that stuff? Okay. So Christ goes about Galilee doing what? 23 and following. He preaches the gospel of the kingdom and heals every disease and every infirmity so that people bring him the sick, those afflicted with various diseases, pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he heals them all. Why? Why does he do this? Two reasons. Well, at least two. Maybe three. What's a given one? What's an easy one? Verification of disease. Okay. Let me ask you another question. Why do people climb Mount Everest? Because they can. He does this because he he can. Okay? Why can he? And John saw the spirit in the form of a dove descend upon him. Okay? What did you say? Verification of who he is. Verificate. How is it verification of who he is? Go back to the prophecies. <clears throat> Go back to the prophets. Look at, for example, <clears throat> Isaiah 60 which Christ is going to reference when we get to, take that back, I'm not going to reference it, when we get to John's Gospel. Okay? In John's Gospel, the very first public thing he's going to do is he's going to go to synagogue, and the leader of the synagogue is going to hand him the scroll. It's like any meaning, well, you do it. Hands him the scroll, and he opens up the scroll, and he will read this passage. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, that is, messiahed me, chosen me, to bring good tidings to the afflicted. The good tidings, that's the good news, the gospel. Okay? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captains, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and he goes on. And look at the other prophets and what do they say about that one who will be anointed, he will heal the sick and such. Okay? Go back to where we were. Go back to where we were. This is proof. Okay? So, chapter 5. He sees the crowds because you start healing people, what's going to happen? 
They're going to follow you. My brother was born with a gimpy leg. He went and saw this guy, and he can walk and run now. I had a cousin, blind from birth. And he saw this guy, and now he sees better than I do. So, crowds are following him. <laughs> he goes up on a mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Okay? Your footnote. Sermon on the Mount sounds the keynote of the new age which Jesus came to introduce. And you're, you go down and says, you know, some of this isn't from the Sermon on the Mountain. It's brought in from other stuff later. Okay? So, notice, it says the crowds follow him. He goes up on the mountain. Jesus sits down. And his disciples came to him. Now, some people interpret that to mean the disciples are just the disciples, the 12, not the crowds. But the crowds are kind of like with Moses down at the bottom of the mountain. So Jesus tells the disciples, and then what's he going to do? He's going to give this talk. Why? The Sermon on the Mount is given to the disciples to go spread it. But at the end of that passage, 728, and when Jesus finished these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Now, that to me kind of says the crowds heard what he said. What the way some interpret it is the crowds are astonished at what is told to them by the disciples. Right? Whichever way it is. So we get the Sermon on the Mount. And notice it begins with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Notice, who are the blessed? Are the blessed the people who are fat, dumb, and happy, the people with the big bank accounts, the people with the nice chariots, the people with the nice... Nope. They're pretty much who? Those for whom life hasn't dealt them the best hand. Okay? Poor in spirit, the mourning ones, those who are meek. Okay? The merciful, the pure at heart, peacemakers. Then it starts to get negative. Well, in one sense, negative. Those who are persecuted for being good, for righteousness sake. And then he gets even more specific. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all manner of evil against you. Falsely notice, first of all, because of me. What's the because of me on my sake imply? Because you follow me. All right? Well, who will be those who will persecute and revile and utter all kinds of evil against them? The scribes, the Pharisees, the lawyers, the leaders. And then he goes on with the Sermon on the Mount, which is essentially all about what? What's the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount? New covenant. Keep going. What's that mean, the new covenant? I mean, you're right. Okay. I came to Jesus fulfilling the law. Yeah, but he does say, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Keep going. Where in the, for example, in the Ten Commandments do you have, but I say to you, do not resist one who is evil, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Because not in the Ten Commandments, but in the Mosaic Law, what are you told to do to somebody, you know, who harms you? What are you told to do to somebody who kills somebody else? <laughs> Strike them down, you know. Okay? But here, not so much. Christ is saying, I've come to fulfill the law, and if you want to fulfill the law, do what I say. He is going to say later on, 
who obey the scribes and Pharisees. He's going to say, do what they tell you to do, but don't do what they do. He's telling us, you're going to see me do what I say. Okay? You've heard it said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, who says that? That's not in the Old Testament. That is, that's not a Mosaic law. That's a Talmudic law. That is an interpretation by the Jewish authorities. Christ said, what good does it do if you love those who love you? I mean, even the pagans do that. No, no, no. I tell you, love those who hate you. Love those who persecute you. That's when he says, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What does that tell us about God? He does what? He loves those who hate him. The Apostle Paul will take that and just run with it. I mean, he'll say, even while we were yet dead in sin, God did what? Jesus. <laughs> That's what he did. Okay? So, he goes on and he tells people, you know, when you give alms, notice it's not if. That's again, that's part of Jewish custom. custom. You see someone who's poor, you see someone who's hungry, help them out. But, when you do that, don't do it so everybody notice you, notices you. Don't go on the internet. Don't go on TV and say, look at me. I'm giving this big, huge donation to XYZ group. You know, He says, do it silently. When you pray, what does he say? Do it silently. He doesn't mean silently without words. He means don't do it publicly. Why? Because there was a practice at the time for public prayers. That is, you would have scribes and Pharisees standing on corners, praying. He's like, those people want to be seen. No, he says, go into your room. And he tells them how to pray. Okay? And notice, it's not my father. It's what? Our. What did we see? Which one was it? It's either Malachi or Zechariah. I think it's Malachi. What did we see, partly at least, in the prophecy in Malachi? God says, those on the east, those on the west. That is, not Jews. I will call to me. Our Father implies the universal fatherhood of God. And what? Thy kingdom come. What's the thy kingdom come? That's wherever we're here. This, the last day. Bring it all in. Okay? But I'm going to show, I think, how in the Gospels, Christ is also saying, that's what? Now. Because once Christ comes, once the anointed one comes, it is the kingdom now. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forget what's that? Forgive us, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Well, look in the next column, verse 25. What does he tell the disciples? Don't worry about life. It's almost like he's channeling Bobby McFerrin before there's Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry. Be happy. Why? Don't worry about tomorrow. God feeds the birds. He loves birds more than... He loves... Sorry. Reverse that. He's not an eco wacko. He loves you more than he loves birds. He's going to feed you. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts, debtors. Forgive us our debts. What's the most important word in those two lines? As... Forgive us as we forgive others. So, he'll go on and explain, if we don't forgive others, then what? Don't forgive us. Okay? And then he goes on, 
chapter, uh, verse 19 and following, about laying up treasures on earth, etc., etc. And J.K. Rowling quotes from this passage in the seventh Harry Potter book. She puts it on a tombstone. And Harry Potter reads it and he's like, what the hell does that mean? Because he's never read the Bible. Literally, I mean, within the course of the novel, it's pretty clear. He's, he's never read the Bible. He's never heard anything about Jesus or God. His, in, his aunt and uncle are total secularists. Okay? So he goes on and explains that by talking about, you know, don't be anxious about life and such. Seek first his kingdom, verse 33, and his righteousness, and then what? All this stuff's going to be added to you. Where did John the Baptist live? In the desert. He sought first God's kingdom. And what did he eat? Honey and locusts. Now, some people will say locusts means like grasshoppers locusts. Others say locusts, that, that what gets translated as locusts is actually referring to a kind of fruit that grew on a plant. It's a small plant, and it's not very, it's not like strawberries or raspberries, but a pretty bitter thing. Do that with that what you want, okay? And then 20, 721, he says something that he's going to come back to in Matthew 25, okay? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, when's that? At the end. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do mighty works? And I'll say, I never knew you depart from me. Which I don't know about you, but... If you're a Christian, that's got to be scary as all hell. Because that implies what? You could go about thinking you're doing everything right, and you die and never knew you. That is, maybe what's meant there, you thought you were doing, but you weren't really doing what I said. So he says back there, He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Go back for a second. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, how do you do that? What did that follow? Remember the handout I gave from Polonius? And Polonius tells his son, Take every man's ear, but give to every man your ear, Take every man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. That is, whenever somebody criticizes you, listen to it, but don't respond. That's pretty much what all that is saying. Take what comes and don't respond. Okay? So, people come up to him and... I wrote a couple notes to myself. Let's go to chapter 8. The, the end of the Sermon on the Mount comes, and we're told, The crowds are amazed, for he taught as one who had authority, not like the scribes. Okay, Chapter 8, verses 10 and following. Truly I say to you, not even Israel have I found such faith. Well, who's he talking about? He goes into Capernaum, and a centurion comes to him and says, Lord, I've got a servant who's sick, you know, in terrible distress. And Jesus goes, I'll fuck him. I'll fix him. He goes, no, 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 you don't have to come. I'm not worthy that you come under the roof of my house. But you say the word, because I'm a man with authority. I told my servant, do this. My servant does it. You just say the word, and I know my servant will be healed. Now, your footnote tells us the centurion, a non-Jewish military officer, is convinced that, de that diseases are as obedient to Jesus as soldiers are to him. 
First of all, I do not believe that Bruce Metzger wrote that footnote. I don't know who did, but that's a stupid footnote. The centurion is not saying that Jesus can say, oh, you AIDS, get out of that person. That's not what the centurion means. When the centurion says, I am a man of authority, and I say to my servant, go do this, and if you say my servant will be healed, what's he implying? That Christ has servants, that all he has to do is say, you know, snap his fingers, and the servant will be healed. I don't think he means he snaps his fingers and the disease magically leaves. I think he means you have servants around you also, not physical ones. And all you have to do is issue the command, and that servant will do your bidding. And so Christ says what? Even in Israel, I haven't seen such, such faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I take that phrase, even in Israel. Well, who else does that include? Peter, James, John, Andrew, Nathaniel, Philip, Matthew. <laughs> I tell you, many will come from east. That's the whole Assyrians, Babylonians, all those people who are no longer around anymore. And west. And they'll sit at a table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That is, they're going to sit down at what's called the marriage feast of the Lamb at the, book of, at the end of the book of Revelation. There's going to be a lot of people, in other words, who aren't Jews, who are going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, while the sons of the kingdom, who are the sons of the kingdom? Jews will be thrown into the outer darkness. Well, who's obviously included in those east and west? Centurion man, whoever it is, okay? Some take it to be Cornelius, the same centurion who was there at the crucifixion, okay? So people ask him, what are you doing hanging around with hookers and lepers? And Jesus says, I come to heal the sick, right? You don't go to a hospital, you don't go to a doctor when you're feeling fine. You go when you're not feeling good. Okay? And various people come up, and we're going to skip a whole bunch. Various people come up, and what do we see him do all throughout? When somebody who is ill comes, does he ever say no? No. <laughs> he heals them all. He gets, at points, it kind of seems like he gets tired of it. He's like, man, I'm not going to be with you all. Okay. Does something, heals somebody. All right? So that's, you know, what's going on. Then we get the parables. Briefly. What's a parable? I've got a note here. It's a story, right? What kind of story is it? How often do the disciples understand the parables? They don't. Jesus tells the parables. And then the disciples ask him, why do you speak in parables? Why do you talk in parables to all the people? 13, 10. And he says, to you, it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom. And he says, because that's what the prophets say. Isaiah, he says, you shall indeed hear, but never understand. You shall indeed see, but never perceive. Okay. So he explains to the disciples what the parables mean. He talks about the parable of the sower. What is being sown, the word of God, etc., etc. Okay? And then he tells another parable, verse 24. The man sowing in his field. He tells another parable, verse 31. He tells another parable, verse 33. I mean, just go one parable after another. Okay? And he finishes. Just about each parable. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Why does he say that? Because not everybody has ears to hear, right? An awful lot of the people Jesus heals have problems with what? Hearing and seeing. Okay? So he physically heals them so they can 
see, and everyone that he does physically heal, what do they say? If they say anything, they say, be merciful to me, Jesus, Son of God. And if it's a demon that's cast out, what does the demon? If the demon speaks, what's the demon always say? What do you have to do with me, Jesus? Thou, and he's like, shut up. Don't tell everybody, okay? So, 13, 53 and following. So he's healing people left and right. And people are like, isn't this Jesus, Mary and Joseph's son? Where did he get this power? Okay. Let's skip a bunch again. I know we've only got a few minutes. So, beginning kind of chapter 15. Or not beginning, but we've seen it already. The scribes and Pharisees come to him. And he says some things about them. In chapter 17, you get the Mount of Transfiguration. Why just Peter, James, and John? Three best friends? Peter's not necessarily a best friend. He's the first called. Okay. James and John, he's actually related to. They're cousins. Okay. Not cousins like they're brothers of... Of John the Baptist. They are, um, according to early biblical, uh, early Christian tradition, they are children of, I think it is Joseph's first wife. Okay? So, we see the Mount of Transfiguration, and what happens? He's transfigured, right? And who starts blabbing? Peter. Oh, this is really great. We ought to make some boots here, and he's talking, talking on. And what do we see? While Peter is talking, a cloud overshadows them, and a voice. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. We've heard that before. That's the same thing that was said when he was baptized. Now, something gets added to it. But bear in mind, none of these three were there when he was baptized. Listen to him. Hear what he has to say. Okay? So Jesus tells them, don't tell anybody about this vision until I come back from the dead. Um, three more minutes. Yeah, we'll stop there. We'll pick up with chapter 18 on Tuesday. Go ahead and read Luke. I'm only going to make a couple of comments about the Gospel of Mark, which I had assigned also today. And I'll let you know on Tuesday if there's going to be an exam over the prophets. Wake up, thing.